Today I thought we'd look back at one of the worst events in American history, and an important one for race relations. You know, for no reason in particular. The story of the tragedy of Tulsa in 1921 can start back a few decades in the past with a man named John the Baptist Stratford, J.B. Stratford for short. Stratford was born in 1861 in Kentucky, making him a very young boy when slavery ended. He managed to be a very rare example of a freed man who managed to acquire land in the South despite resistance such as Jim Crow laws or the hostile racist attitude against such a thing in the first place. In the late 19th century, property ownership was a form of success and wealth. The American dream changes all the time throughout American history, but a good chunk of it, owning land was considered the jackpot ending. If you had your own land, you could in theory not only be self-sustaining, but potentially have generational wealth for you and your family. African Americans upon emancipation from slavery weren't just given land, so most of them moved on to sharecropping, which was basically their same lives, but they got a portion of the food that grew. So for freedmen to own land, that was a first step towards any sort of success. Stratford acquired land near modern-day Tulsa, Oklahoma, and believed that if other African Americans pooled their resources, they could build a successful community in the area. Another black landowner from Arkansas named O. W. Gurley purchased 40 acres of land around Tulsa in 1906 and joined in this idea. In 1907, Oklahoma became a state, and while segregation existed in Tulsa, the lands of these two were enough to have a successful black community that would be known as Greenwood. Oklahoma's segregation laws were some of the most strict, and as a result, it added an extra importance to residents of Greenwood to help ensure each other's prosperity by supporting each other's businesses. Greenwood managed to succeed and become one of the wealthiest black communities in the country. Many African Americans from other states would migrate to here in spite of Oklahoma's segregation laws because of Greenwood's prosperity. Mining and oil work helped bring new wealth to the region as well, and eventually Greenwood brought the African American population to 12.3% in Tulsa, despite only being 7-8% for the entire state. This gave Greenwood the nickname Little Africa, while the wealth also gave it the nickname Black Wall Street. This reputation of success in a state with racist laws and residents heightened tensions. In 1915, the second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan began, and by 1921 the city of Tulsa had an estimated 4.4% of its residents with a no membership with the KKK. With the rise of racist lynching and KKK membership, the possibility of a dispute or conflict was rising. On May 30th of 1921, a 19-year-old African-American named Dick Rowland was an employed shoe shiner at a Tulsa Main Street building called the Drexel Building. On Memorial Day, most people weren't working, but he was. A 17-year-old white woman named Sarah Page was also working as an elevator operator. Dick Rowland had to use the restroom, and with segregated bathrooms, his was all the way on the top floor, requiring the use of the elevator. What happened next is not fully known, but a store clerk within the building heard what he interpreted as a female scream and went to the area to find Rowland and leaving the building, and Sarah distraught. The clerk assumed that Roland tried to assault her and called the authorities. There are many theories as to what actually happened. Everyone who knew Dick Roland thought the idea of him assaulting anyone was unbelievably out of character. Considering it wasn't uncommon for mere rumors of minor altercations being used as an excuse for lynch mobs, it would be something he'd want to avoid regardless. The most common theory is that he tripped and accidentally grabbed onto her arm to prevent himself from falling, which would elicit the startled noise. This seems to be supported by the fact that the police, when called, didn't believe it was an assault and just kept it at a low investigation rather than a manhunt. Page would eventually end up not wanting to charge him. While it would appear to be that this was a misunderstanding misreported by a clerk that got handled surprisingly peacefully, it wasn't over. Rumors alone could cause a lynch mob, so Roland went to his mother's house in Greenwood District for safety out of worry, but this only raised suspicions. On May 31st the next day, Roland got arrested anyway. Death threats arrived, and one made to the jail specifically caused Roland to be moved to a cell on the top floor of the Tulsa courthouse. Also on the 31st, the Tulsa Tribune published a story about the incident. The paper was already known for making sensationalist headlines, but it was one out of two white newspapers in the city and was still read by a wide audience as a result. Looking at the article, you can already see how this is specifically framed to encourage a lynch mob. Not only does the title literally encourage the reader to nab Roland, but reports that Page claimed she was scratched on the hands and face with torn clothes, something not noted by the police at the initial reporting. It's unclear if this is Page's actual story at the time, or if it's the sensationalist newspaper over-exaggerating and making it up. 
The article then specifies Roland confessed to at least touching her arm while emphasizing the girl was an orphan and working to pay off her college. Regardless of whether the assault happened, it's not unthinkable that the wording of this article would elicit emotions in the reader and could inspire a lynch mob. Sure enough, one hour after the Tribune published this, the police were already alerted to the mob. By 7.30 p.m., hundreds were outside the courthouse. The residents of Greenwood were worried about the lynch mob and decided to send armed residents to help the sheriff defend the courthouse, several members of which were African-American World War I veterans. When they arrived, some rumors said that the sheriff invited them, while others said there was now a black uprising, both of which were false, as the sheriff didn't call them, nor was the intent of the African-American group to cause an insurrection, so much as prevent what they believed to be an inevitable, unjust lynching. As tensions rose, eventually one armed white man asked an armed African-American to surrender his pistol. Upon refusal, a shot was fired. Thus began the conflict. As things escalated, the white mob began to loot Greenwood for more supplies, and so the fight moved into Greenwood altogether. Members of the American Legion defended surrounding white neighborhoods, but did not stop the looting. In fact, the ones that did interfere in Greenwood just helped local law enforcement arrest African Americans instead. Eventually, the white mob threw lit oiled rags into Greenwood buildings and ignited many buildings on fire. In surrounding neighborhoods, despite American Legion protection, many families that merely hired black cooks or houseworkers were also looted. The next morning, planes flew over Greenwood. The police used them for reconnaissance, but there were many witnesses who saw the planes drop projectiles and shoot at African Americans in Greenwood. While some claims such as an ordered firebombing are considered unknown in their validity, there is enough eyewitness testimony and evidence that at least some people in the planes were shooting and dropping projectiles of sorts. Some people mention nothing, some people mention turpentine balls being used to spread the fires. Regardless, it still speaks to the escalated nature of these riots that the police had to use aerial force at all. The fires and increasing number of armed white rioters forced the African Americans defending Greenwood to retreat further north. By 9 a.m. on June 1st, troops of the National Guard arrived, and martial law was declared at 11.49 a.m. By the middle of the afternoon, the violence had ended, and the National Guard reported that while they dealt with fire from both armed groups, they ultimately arrested 30 to 40 African Americans, while delivering another 320 to local authorities to ultimately be arrested there. Martial law would end on June 4th. Greenwood was basically destroyed. A junior high school, the only hospital in the area, and several churches were destroyed, along with 191 businesses and 1,256 houses were burned down. The amount of damage and loss in today's money amounts to about $32 million. The death toll from all of this varied in number in the following days. Strangely, the Tulsa Tribune across two days went from 68 African Americans dead to 176 African Americans dead in the afternoon edition to finally settling on only 21 African Americans dead and 9 whites dead. At first, Tulsa vowed to erase this embarrassment by offering to help acquire funds to help rebuild Greenwood, but those funds never happened. Greenwood was rebuilt, but it would never return to its original prominence. What happened next was Tulsa and the state of Oklahoma erased the embarrassment by not mentioning it at all. No convictions of violence-related charges came, and the local and state records omitted this riot altogether. Fire department records didn't mention it either. The Tulsa Tribune paper, which traditionally had featured articles on events that happened 15 and 25 years ago, omitted the riot's anniversaries. The African American community definitely remembered, but like a horrific suppressed memory, tried to move on the best it could. This led to generations passing by where most people weren't aware of the 1921 riots at all. Archives even removed newspaper articles made during the days of the riots. Greenwood went from Black Wall Street to that poor run-down neighborhood in Tulsa. Despite effectively silencing the memories of these events, eventually demands arose for a proper investigation of events. In 1996, 75 years after the riots, a commission was created to investigate the events and give recommended ways to find justice for the victims, possible reparations for their descendants, and some way to restore the memory of the event through a monument. In 2001, the report was published and delivered with bipartisan support and enthusiasm. If you want to read it yourself, the whole thing is on archive.org and I've linked to it in the description. Part of the commission involved resolving the number of dead, as the numbers previously estimated not only varied, but seemed surprisingly low. They wanted to search for mass graves, groups of people who would have died during the gunfight and have been buried on the spot hastily. Their investigation found no evidence of mass graves, but definitely enough missing people that could be considered dead by all intents and purposes. The commission ended up varied with the final result in that they confirmed that 26 African Americans and 13 whites were declared dead by found hospital records. 
but the estimated total death count was ranged between 75 and 300. Sadly, though, the true numbers may never be known. 118 known survivors that were still alive in 2001, the youngest at the age of 85, were given medals and the governor passed a law acknowledging the existence of the riots. But just like the promise made by Tulsa in 1921, the reparations never happened. In 2003, when there was a lawsuit over having not followed through on the entire commission's goals, it was dismissed by the federal courts due to the statute of limitations on events and the Supreme Court never took the case. A new attempt at an act of reparations began in 2009, but never got passed by both chambers of the local legislature. As of 2020, there's only two known survivors from the riots left. I wanted to make a video on these events because, as we witness several race riots occurring now, it's important to look back on history to understand why these sort of things happen and how they compare and lead up to events in the present. This event occurred 99 years ago, yet peaceful protests and violent riots over systemic racism still occur. Obviously Tulsa isn't the same as the events occurring right now, but it's still an important example about how a misunderstanding and racist attitude can destroy an entire community. The unofficial censorship of the events for a whole 75 years is also a grim reminder of the importance of recording history or else risk events being forgotten forever. It also shows that the racial divide in the United States has made significant improvements, but still continues to this day. Riots and protests may start over different events and at various levels of intensity, but the underlying racial tensions as the theme is still there, whether through lynch mobs, police brutality, or disproportionate arrests. If you want all lives to matter, black lives need to be included in that. So yes, black lives matter. Protesting is an important and necessary right enshrined in the American Constitution. Police brutality not only exists, but should be denounced, and we must make changes to eliminate systemic racism. But riots, no matter which side starts them, should not be condoned. Fight for justice, stand up to police brutality, but don't give the system an excuse to just use more militarized force and set back the cause. Learn from history to help prevent police brutality in the future. I'm Emperor Tigerstar, thank you for watching.